But now to our first keynote speaker for this morning, Ms. Sarah Chase. She's author of the prize-winning book, Thieves of State, Why Corruption Threatens Global Security, and a forthcoming book, Kleptocracy in America. Sarah Jay's remarkable trajectory has led her from reporting from Paris for National Public Radio and covering the fall of the Taliban in Afghanistan to running a soap factory in downtown Kandahar in the midst of a reigniting insurgency. She went on to advise the topmost levels of the US military, serving as special advisor to two commanders of the international forces in Kabul and then chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Mike Mullen. She left the Pentagon for a five-year stint at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, where she extracted the broadly relevant core from those experiences. Internationally recognised for her innovative thinking on corruption and its implications, she has uncovered the unrecognised reality that severe and structured corruption can prompt international crises such as revolutions and other uprisings, violent insurgency and environmental devastation. Corruption of this sort is the operating system of sophisticated networks which weave together government officials, business magnates, private charities, out-and-out -out criminals, and represents, in her view, the primary threat to democracy in our lifetimes. She's joining us this morning from the US by video. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Sarah Chase. Thank you very much indeed. And let me say, first of all, that I really wish I was there um, and that it's a first for me to address, first of all, a group of such distinguished practitioners in this field, um, and then also to be doing it from the comfort of my office. So please excuse any awkwardness due to this sort of video link. Um, and some of what I wanna say, you know, I, I almost feel like any of you having listened to that readout of what you did yesterday, um, it's almost as though any of you could get up here and give this talk. But I'd like to approach um, something that you may be working on the sort of practical and very specific nitty gritty details. Let me take a step back a little bit and, and, and try to place your efforts within a much broader context. Um, and I'd like to start with a couple of what may look like truisms. Corruption is not part of anyone's culture. I don't know how often I've heard, um, oh, that's just how they do it in South Asia, or Africans or you know, Nigerians are corrupt. I'm sorry, but I don't, I have not met a single Nigerian or Tunisian or Honduran who said, Sarah, would you get off your corruption shtick? You know, I mean, that's just Western, Western values. We really don't mind corruption here. That's not anyone's perspective. And and interestingly, I hear those types of comments almost exclusively on the part of, of uh, Westerners. That being said, I do think the notion of a more permissive environment for corruption, as opposed to more social um, intolerance for corruption, is a real one and confronts us in developed countries as well as developing countries. Corruption is not victimless. That is much clearer, again, in countries where police officers shake down, you know, motorists by the side of the road, but it's something to bear in mind. It's not just about money. This has become increasingly clear, uh, especially, again, given some of the topics of this uh, conference. But just to put uh, that in another context, northern Nigeria discussing corruption within the justice sector with a group of Nigerian lawyers um, and other court officials. And a prosecutor stops me and says, Sarah, you know, you're just talking about money. It's not just about money. And I said, really? And he goes on to tell me the story of the woman whose husband is in preventative detention, who's diabetic. And the woman says, I need to get my husband out of jail to the judge. 
he's diabetic. I guarantee that I will, you know, render him on the proper day. It's a bailable offense. And the judge takes advantage of her. That was a shocker for me. This was some years ago. Now it's a much more spoken about issue, sextortion. And as a woman, obviously, I'm extremely distressed. As a corruption professional, sorry, as a security professional, I have a second thought, which is, what about her brother? What does that woman's brother want to do? He wants to kill the judge. This is northern Nigeria. There's an anti-government insurgency afoot called Boko Haram. The brother, if anything, has to resist the effort, Boko Haram's effort to make him kill the judge. These were the types of situations I ran into a lot in places where you had anti-government insurgencies um, in an extremely corrupt uh, environment. We'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, that actually brings to the last point on this slide, it enrages people. When, no matter how much or little money is taken away, corruption enrages people. And that's something to bear in mind when we, you know, which we often do, seek numbers. What's the quantity of corruption? Well, that tells you something, but it doesn't tell you everything. about. Even if you could get the numbers, it doesn't tell you some of the most important things about the, the, the phenomenon, which is how, um, uh, indignant the victims become. Corruption is not perpetrated by isolated individuals. Obviously, I think you've been discussing that. Um, and let me just walk you through um, this notion of corruption as the operating system of sophisticated uh, integrated networks. Um, this is the paper that these slides are taken out of. I don't need to dwell on that. Um, this is obviously a very schematic diagram. Um, it's meant to show how interconnected the strands are. I've used the color blue for public sector, the color green for private sector because American money is green, and red for the criminal sector. And we'll, we'll um, go through a couple of the details. But one thing I'd like to point out before we move on is that this diagram is misleading in the sense that it implies that the corrupt network is located solely in Honduras. The more I study this, the more convinced I am that these networks are transnational in nature, just as the transnational criminal uh, organizations and the multinational businesses are that make up two of the strands. So a better way of imagining what this looks like might be a, an airplane, you know, an airline route map that shows hubs in various cities and then those arcing lines that connect the hubs. That's really what these networks look like. So I'd like to just take you through, through a few components. I'm using Honduras as an example, but I think this framework is largely applicable elsewhere. Um, Sorry, one other thing I'd like to say is that obviously these networks are configured somewhat differently in different countries. They may be more or less centralized. They may be more or less um, kind of disrupted by internal rivalry. In some countries, you might see the private sector clearly in the lead, in which case I would have made that green um, band a little bit wider than the others. In other cases, it's the public sector, it's the government that's really running the network, or I would say the government officials who are members of the network who are running the network. Um, so they look a little bit different in different countries, but still it's a useful framework, I think, for understanding the phenomenon. So um, public sector, what are some of the, the, the role of the members of the network who have jobs in the public sector who are public officials is to either ideally weaponize the institutions and agencies in their grasp or over which they have responsibility to serve the purposes of the network rather than the rather than the rights of the citizens or if they can't actually weaponize them 
to ha systematically hollow them out. Sometimes also they use them as revenue streams, like the defense budget is classically a revenue stream for kleptocratic networks. So, um, so the borders between these ways of thinking are a little bit um, loose. But obviously the legislature is, um, the writing of laws is something that a kleptocratic network work wants to be able to do. Or if it can't actually run the legislature, often what it will do is hollow it out by reducing staff, by reducing salaries, by limiting um, powers, etc. The judiciary is a really, or the justice sector more broadly, is an absolutely critical instrument of state function for a kleptocratic network to control. First, in order to ensure impunity for its own members. Second, in order to weaponize the justice sector or the justice function against rivals or opponents. Um, these networks are also vertically integrated. And so the police officer on the street is sending a cut of the bribes that he or she extorts up the line in return precisely for the impunity that's provided um, by control of the justice sector. The police. So I put the police in here, but what I really mean is a formal instrument of force. In different countries, it's going to be a different instrument of force. Sometimes it's a particular unit in the army. In uh, Mubarak's Egypt, uh, Gamal Mubarak had a particular unit of the police called Amin Sorta, which he used to kind of control the environment. Um, this is an interesting one in, in Honduras. It doesn't exist everywhere, but it was a commission or is a commission which decides on what proje projects will be given over to public-private partnerships. And public-private partnerships are a classic way for a kleptocratic network to move money out of a budget that has oversight into its own hands. This is an interesting one. It's the uh, public electricity sector. I have found in every single kleptocracy I've looked at that energy is always a revenue stream that's captured. What's interesting in Honduras is there is no oil. There's no, I want to say, fossil fuel. Um, and it's quite interesting to see how the networks were able to siphon money out of the electricity department uh, and even green energy, which we can talk about later. Obviously, regulatory and audit bodies, those are, are typically disabled, crippled, hollowed out, and so on. And a very significant one in all of the countries I've looked at is, in, is environment ministries and environment regulators. And it's another reason I wish I were in Australia is because I love the way you open public meetings with a recall of the people who have been on these lands before us. And those peoples often um, protected and cared for those lands better than we do. And back to culture, it's quite interesting to me that the belief systems of indigenous peoples are typically demonized by kleptocratic kleptocratic networks, and you will see indigenous peoples on the forefront of the fight against the environmental exploitation, which is typically being uh, carried out by kleptocratic networks. Let's look at some private sector elements of networks like these. Always you get the financial sector. Always, as I say, you get energy. Here I put including gasoline. What I discovered is also including in Honduras green energy. And hydroelectric power was considered green energy and therefore eligible for carbon credits. So that became or becomes a, a big new revenue stream of feeding kleptocratic networks. Uh, High-end real estate and construction, always. Luxury real estate, as well as infrastructure construction. Nonprofit organizations, I think you've discussed that a little bit. Charities. Um, and we have 
uh, you know, you, you saw it in Central Asia, in Uzbekistan, um, uh, Karimov, the former president of Uzbekistan, his daughter had a nonprofit like this. We have run into it in corruption allegations in the United States with the Clinton Foundation. It's a classic. Media, of course, um, is an important factor. And here's one that I put in at least to hint at the transnational nature of these, um, of these networks. To what extent is foreign direct investment, in fact, a, a, uh, an external network member? An example I've used is the case of British Petroleum in Azerbaijan. Now, I don't know it to be the case that it is a member of the um, Aliyev network, but if I were researching it closely, I would start looking at who's who, I'd look at pattern of life, I'd look at how intertwined are they socially and otherwise with members of Aliyev's family and his close um, associates. So foreign direct investment is something really that requires a lot of scrutiny. Criminal elements, obviously, in Honduras, narcotics trafficking, um, including its transnational um, dimensions. Human trafficking, we're all dealing with um, issues of migration and refugees, gangs and other armed groups. This is really critical because just as kleptocratic networks like to have a formal instrument of force, they also love to have an informal instrument of force, a plausibly deniable instrument of force at their disposal. Um, in the case of Honduras, we in the United States had heard a lot about, as we were getting waves of miners running away from Central America beginning in 2014, and this was a new phenomenon, what I kept hearing in the media was, oh, it's because of the violence, it's because of the extortion being committed by the gangs. Well, it took me about two days on the ground in Honduras to discover that the police, which typically extort people in corrupt countries, were outsourcing their corruption to the, to the gangs. So the gangs were permitted to operate so long as they kicked back a cut of the take to the police. Um, and of course, that type of permission is always um, revocable uh, if necessary. That's the transnational uh, side of the narcotics trafficking. Okay, now we get to those little, that, those little orbits and get to us, frankly, um, when we're talking about corruption in the developing world. To what extent are our activities providing vital services to kleptocratic networks or enabling them? So obviously some of the external service providers that have attracted a lot of attention of late have been lobbying firms, lawyers and registered agents and real estate agents, which have been making a business model out of servicing corrupt officials. Enablers are subtler. To what extent do our country's security assistance, development assistance, even development lending serve to reinforce these uh, networks? Um, stature enhancing public meetings, awards and, and honors that think tanks or universities might bestow on people or anti-corruption um, charities I have seen actually bestow honors on officials I know to be corrupt. Um, so these are very problematic and have much more of an impact in home countries than, um, than we may be aware. Okay, how does this lead to security threats? Um, as I said before, um, corruption is not a victimless crime. Corruption 
uh, enrages people. So if you look at this picture more broadly, what I'm pointing to here is the flow of money into developing countries from developed countries, which is captured by the kleptocratic network and is recycled into the kleptocratic network and then often sent offshore to, you know, lucrative investments in real estate, you know, or football teams or uh, hedge funds or what have you. And the populations of these countries are aware and they're angry. And I would say that almost every major security threat the world is facing today can be traced in part back to corruption. So this particular picture, I believe, is actually the um, revolution in Burkina Faso in 2015, which in fact was a remarkably nonviolent event. There was some looting, but it was a massive anti-corruption uprising led by a group of young um, artists, actually performance artists and a couple of journalists, and they had been preparing the ground for several years ahead of time um, with what they called citizenship caravans. And what those were about were the rights and responsibilities of citizenship, but also the, requi the, the responsibilities of public officials, in particular, to be accountable to the citizens. And so when the then president um, proclaimed that he was running for an extra term, the place blew up. And it was a really interesting revolution. It, as I say, was uh, pretty, um, I want to say, sporty. Uh, and there was certainly some looting and property damage. There, were, there was no serious violence against people. Uh, it succeeded in forcing the resignation of the president. There was a transitional period during which a very serious uh, series of anti-corruption uh, laws were drafted and passed. There was an attempted coup by that formal instrument of force that the kleptocratic network had relied on, which was a particular unit of the army. And Interestingly, the population, again, led by this same group, which was called Citizens Broom, went to the army. I mean, they turned out into the streets again, but they in particular focused on the regular army and said, wait a second, you know, your citizens like us don't let this coup go through. And that's what happened. The army actually left its barracks and pre prevented the coup. Um, so I, I put a rather violent picture there, but it in fact represents one of the most positive examples of the type of disruption I'm talking about that I've seen in a number of years. But, you know, and along those lines, you see uprisings in Latin America, in Guatemala, in Brazil, where you have had citizens in the street for weeks on end. You saw South Korea doing the same thing, Romania. Um, so it's quite interesting that these types of uprisings have taken place in, on almost every continent, in very diverse cultures and political systems. Also, in, political, uh, in opposing political orientations. So you've seen them in you know, leftist Venezuela and very, um, I want to say, free market capitalist Honduras. So there is no political system that is automatically immune from this phenomenon that we're talking about. Um, moving up from, uh, you know, nonviolent revolution, e even so, nonviolent revolution is an extremely, uh, I want to say, um, disrupting phenomenon. Think about the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring everywhere. Um, uh, you know, tore through much of, you know, the connective tissue of three continents. 
um, and led to very serious security ramifications in places like Egypt um, and, and other parts of North Africa or Ukraine, where a similar uprising then sparked a um, reaction by Russia that has sent the, you know, northern western world back into almost a repeat of the cold war um i got into this whole issue in the midst of an insurgency in southern afghanistan where i was living and 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 hearing from my neighbors that it wasn't religious fanaticism per se or um revulsion at western culture that was driving a return in popularity of the, uh, or uh, yeah, return of the Taliban, it was in fact indignation at, corru at the corruption of the Karzai government and the role of the Western, of a lot of Western countries, in, in particular the United States, in enabling it. And the argument the Taliban made was the reason our government is so corrupt, or let's go back to that to that Nigerian story, the reason the judge took advantage of you or took advantage of your sister is because he doesn't fear God. And if only we had a government that obeyed God's law, um, things wouldn't be so corrupt. Now, that's a spurious argument. You just have to look at the behavior of Boko Haram, the behavior of the Taliban, the behavior of you know the theocracy in Iran, and its corruption to know that that's another system of government that is not immune from corruption. But if you're a 21 year old indignant Afghan man, you're not doing comparative political analysis, right? I mean, it's a really convincing argument. And I've spoke, spoken to people in Medjugorje in, in uh, Nigeria who um, regretted their support for, the, for Boko Haram, but just about everyone I know in northern Nigeria supported them at the outset. So it spins into this kind of extremist religious violence or extremist ideological violence, um, environmental devastation, as we've talked about. And as I've said, a supreme threat to um, to democracy, because these networks are globalized, they are aggressive, and they lack a worldview. So let me go back. They're aggressive. There are places where they are being deliberately exported as an element of state policy. And I think Russia and China are doing this very clearly. Um, but I'm sure they're not the only ones, and they're not operating exclusively in their regions. Kleptocratic personnel and practices are being injected into countries with stronger democratic institutions in order to undermine them. And I'm speaking to you here from Washington, D.C., and we know something about it. Um, and as I say, it's coming to the fore now. But just recently, for example, um, a think tank called the Council on Foreign Relations, based in New York, um, very prestigious American think tank, um, accepted a gift of $12 million from Leonard, who calls himself Len Blavatnik, who is a member of Putin's kleptocratic network who is one of the less obvious ones because he obtained UK and US citizenship. And with that protection, he has busily been injecting himself into the political system, into the economic system by investing in, a, for example, a massive aluminum plant um, that is supported by the um, speaker of our, uh, sorry, the majority leader of our Senate. Um, and uh, think tanks like the Council on Foreign Relations. This is deliberate policy. And the problem is that these, these networks, as I say, lack a triumphant worldview the way, let's say, communism had. And so they're kind of spreading themselves around like an invisible gas. And in some ways, I think that makes them 
even more dangerous than some of the threats to our stability or security that uh, developed countries reacted to very strongly, like the USSR or like Nazi Germany. And finally, I want to leave you um, with an even more, I want to say, um, chilling view of how dangerous this is. As I've been working on this book, um, I've been looking historically at what was the last period in which we could say that kleptocratic networks had held such sway over, I would say, developed or industrialized or industrializing countries. Um, again, I think that corruption is a constant in, I want to say, organized human society, but I don't think it's always as um, organized, uh, systematic, and dominant as it is today. The last time it was, I believe, is in the second part of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, broadly what's known as the Gilded Age, from about 1870 until approximately World War II. Then you also had um, networks of government officials, um, monopolistic business magnates, um, and outside criminals who dominated the political economies, certainly of um, the United States and European countries, uh, again, regardless of the political system. What was it that cured the world of, let's say, the Gilded Age syndrome? There were very significant um, strains of resistance to that type of political economy. Um, they were to be found in a widespread labor movement um, across, again, um, on both sides of the Atlantic anyway. I, I don't know what that looked like in Australia, but there really was a burgeoning um, organi organization of labor. There were some very inventive um, political, uh, I want to say, thinking going on that led to a variety of alternative political systems. Um, none of which in their incarnation on earth uh, avoided the same problem of corruption, but there were really important political movements. Uh, over here in the US, we had a remarkable movement called the Farmers Alliance, which was uh, a movement of, of homesteaders, of farmers scattered across the wilderness who would meet at local schoolrooms once a week and um, take lectures and traveling lectures and really think through um, how they needed, what they needed to do first economically and eventually politically to try to crack the stranglehold um, of these networks. And they came up with a lot of um, political innovations that were eventually adopted, like direct election of our senators and, and um, frankly, a um, flexible paper currency was their idea. That didn't happen while they still existed. Those reforms didn't come until much later. And what I've come to is that what it took to actually shock the world out of the culture of wealth maximization that led to um, this domination by kleptocratic networks was a series of global disasters that sparked, frankly, a kind of solidarity as widespread disaster does. In fire and flood, people who suffered band together and help each other out regardless of class or color or creed. The world went through World War I, the Great Depression, World War II, 
all three partially at least brought about by kleptocratic practices. That's what it took to break down that political economy. Two world wars, two genocides, an atomic bomb, the power to wipe out our species, a plague of the proportions of the bubonic plague in the Spanish flu, and a global economic meltdown. You folks being down under didn't protect Australia and Australians from these blows. We are on the same course today. If you look at the Gilded Age, what you see is a series of financial and economic crises that led to depressions and panics of various um, degrees, uh, sorry, of various um, yeah, degrees of seriousness. It plunged us into two world wars. The current let's say, version of this phenomenon got underway based on my research in about 1980 kicked into high gear really with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the 90s. During those years, we have seen, again, panic after panic, collapse after collapse, disaster after disaster. We're locked onto the same course, and yet we still haven't quite come together in the determined way that's re required to root out this type of practice, to truly reform our political economies. And so what I'd just like to say is you in this room who are fighting the anti-corruption fight, you're on the front lines of the most important fight facing our generation. The disasters that lie ahead could dwarf the disasters of the first half of the 20th century into almost insignificance. The forces we're playing with, especially the environmental forces, are of a nature that we have never encountered before. So bravo, thank you for being here at these two days and go to it. Thank you very much. Wow. Um, Sarah, uh, thank you so much for um, an incredibly challenging presentation. I think a lot of yesterday we were talking about corruption in systems and organisations and I think you've challenged us to think about a much bigger global picture and the fact that we're not immune. Um, the words organi organised, sy systematic and dominant really resonated with me and made me think as it maybe made you think about this bigger picture that we're all operating in and the role it's playing. So thank you again for such a challenging presentation and um, I think it's given us much to work from. Uh, please join me in thanking Sarah Chase.